Oh man, welcome. My name is Chris Sarda. This is Cast and Comics. You can find me at Cast and Comics at Instagram and Twitter. Feeling refreshed. Um, just came from a little vacation with friends. Uh, we went to Newport Beach where uh, no one was social distancing or wearing a mask. Um, so uh, that's probably the most normal it's felt to me. I mean, that's not a good or bad thing, right? But, uh, you know, when we mostly stayed in the house or at the beach, because we had kids and stuff, it was a, it was a three friend, three couples and two of them had kids. And, uh, and you know, we went to the beach, so my son could play in the beach. He loves the water so much, and we'd been all cooped up, and my wife's going a little bit crazy because, um, you know, she's pregnant, she's gonna have a kid in January, and, you know, she's worried she won't be able to do anything for, like, going on two years or something. So we may also visit a national park or something, something we can do, um, you know, that's pretty, that's not excuse me, involve large, large crowds or whatever. So um, Newport sort of did though. It wasn't a week, it wasn't a holiday weekend at Newport Beach, but man, they're like people walking around didn't seem uh, to worry about it. I would say it's 20% where the rest of California, when I stopped, you know, there was, everyone was wearing a mask. So um, it's my uh, story about being somewhat irresponsible. And today I stayed home. I took Monday off, um, you know, hanging out with my little boy and stuff. Women don't do that. If my wife would have taken Monday off, that means we wouldn't have left till today and, you know, she'd have been tired on Tuesday. So I always like to try to find that day off, you know, between work, like when I'm already home so I can be bored or something like that. Anyway, that's, uh, that's just uh, the way men think and the way, I won't say women, my wife, but women. So another thing I did was um, try, number one, not do through StreamYard. So I haven't recorded on my phone in a long time. Um, hopefully it doesn't die or something. Um, but, uh, damn, I thought it was a smaller stack, but we're going to try to go much quicker. I want to see if I can do a video that's not 45 minutes just for the fun of it. Uh, first up is the amulet. This is a, a kid's book or a young adult or a, you know, the kind of book that hopefully your, your child can read with you unless you're some kind of crazy religion and believes this is witchcraft and evil. Uh, read Picked this up because of John's Comics with Kids, one of the books that his daughters were reading. I believe it was Charlie. And uh, I loved it. I am sort of dipping my toe in what is cool in that sort of young adult or, or younger world. Just so I could be ready for cool things to read with my son. And uh, this is one of them. If I have any complaint is that I already know that there's nine volumes out there. And, uh, and I know this could only touch the surface, you know, like they've, they've barely done anything in the amulet world or the fantasy world or anything like that. So in, in the sense that it makes me actually want more and that I'll probably go buy this and, and still continue to read it as an adult, um, is, is mostly a good thing, you know, so just scratch the surface. I think a lot of, um, negative reviews on first issues come because of that, because, uh, you've just scratched the surface and the, there's complete Mr. Gun, whether you're going to whether it's going to continue or, or be something to uh, read or watch or consume later on, uh, makes people go, well, I don't, I don't get what's happening. It didn't, wasn't enough or something, you know? So, uh, next up is lost soldiers. This, um, actually number two is coming out this Wednesday. Apparently I hadn't heard anyone talk about it either. Um, Perry, I, I just, I watch a lot of your guys' videos. I rarely watch the, the preview videos cause I already know what's coming out, right. Or what I want, but I did watch Perry's this week. And, um, you know, he mentioned that, Hey, number two is coming out and that no one talked about number one. And that is true. Nobody talked about number one. And, uh, this is actually a really good book, a really good war book, sort of, a um, psychological, uh, you know, about being in the trenches, what it does to you and, and sort of fills that in, um, for today too, because there is, uh, you know, the, the more rugged, the, you know, the warriors in Vietnam are now older and they're sort of like a, they look like mercenaries now. So you get something happening today also. Um, and there's a lot of like, you know, PTSD stuff in there that, you know, is going to be, um, talked about and, and even some more. So I really like this as a first book, sort of like what I just said though. I still don't, I don't know what's going on. I just know sort of the basis 
for at least two of the characters. Uh, after that is Firepower. I'm not sure if I talked about this. I opened it up to read it and then I realized I did read it. Uh, so if I have number two too, it's floating somewhere. I don't even know where it is right now. Um, I think it's just okay. And it's not like I read number one and two. I read the free comic book day issue and the graphic novel prequel and number one. So unless number two knocks me off my socks, I probably won't keep buying it. Um, but I will say that uh, it seems like Robert Kirkman's one of those guys. One, he has staying power. So this is going to go the 20 or so issues. And it seems like he's one of those guys where this great mythology gets built around it. Like you, you get to like issue 20 and I'm thinking of some people I know reading Oblivion song, you get to issue 20 and then people are like, you, you realize like how big the world's gotten around it. So um, I think he's, I think he's a really good writer. I think he's, you know, I think it's generally basic, but uh, hits the right beats and is fun. You know, just in, in these two issues, it hasn't grabbed me. I'm going to wait for people to tell me it's it's awesome and look for it in trade. But I say that, but I haven't read Oblivion Song yet in trade. I read the first five or six issues or something. I didn't start picking that up. So, uh, Rick and Morty Go to Hell. I think I won't pick this up afterwards. I mean, it's the same sort of hijinks. Um, okay, okay jokes in it. Uh, I could hold these up closer, huh? But, you know, I don't know why I don't just pick up the regular... Um, the regular issues. And the reason I was even picking them up is because there was a break between the show. Uh, and now I haven't watched any of the episodes from the new season, uh, it, probably because I don't have the channel. Um, so I still have those to watch. So I, I probably won't bother with the comics. I, I like to sort of dip it in to get some, you know, that kind of comedy. Not really much out there like that, um, except for Rick and Morty, you know. Uh, I think some people will try to point me to that. Um, not war corns, but uh, Dylan's comics with kids had me read something that was pretty funny. I forget what it's called now, but it had that little like, you know, double comedy wacky nature to it. Engine word number two. Um, you know, new society, post-apocalyptic. It's in the future, and there's a class war built around it. So it's in that sense, like the way I just put it there, it's super super generic. Um, but the two issues were written well and it's pretty good and who knows where, who knows where it can go with that. You know, I feel like I, I read a lot of, uh, you know, old earth kind of stuff. Um, I love the way that, uh, I love the way that they are treating machines as if they're magical or religious, uh, thing that you exercise demons out of them and stuff like that. Uh, I like the class war stuff. I've always liked that stuff. So how that works out later um, will be interesting to see. Uh, I don't know that I buy number three, but um, with Vault lately, I have been buying a couple trades and I haven't read them. I was trying to think of Vault. I think I, it was Aftershock where I had two trades just sort of fall apart on me. Um, one of them was Midnight Vista. I can't remember the other one. So I don't want that to happen. If your trade is just gonna tear as I'm turning the pages, then you're not gonna get me to buy the floppies or the trades. Uh, not sure why I bought this. This is uh, shiny. I think um, this is Mega Man, fully charged. Uh, I think what Mega Man is sort of proves, um, and this is, even though I didn't love this and I won't buy number two, um, it sort of proves that it's one of the things, and I haven't worked this out completely, this argument, but that where I want to call comics, comic books the superior medium, um, it may not be sold in the superior medium in individual issues or, or too focused on superheroes. So there's other reasons it's not, but just the medium as being superior, especially for things, um, like Mega Man, I think, uh, I can make a good argument on it. And that's because Mega Man and many other things, Alien, and well, I find out that's not true about Alien. I'll talk about that in a second, but, uh, you know, Predator or Venom or something, they are, uh, they are things that are cool. Uh, because of their designs, which I've touched on before. Mega Man's the same way. It's cool, but not necessarily because it's designed, but because of the video game, right? And the video game didn't have this deep storyline. It was mostly about uh, getting weapons and destroying robot monsters and, you know, progressing on like a video game's supposed to get you to do. <coughs> and, um, you know, one of the reasons I think comics is a superior or a definitely underrated medium is that we can bring stuff in for relatively cheap and and make a whole mythology around it like 
there's not a lot to Mega Man, but in the comics, you can build something. And, and you could say, oh, but you could do that in books too or in short stories, you could, but that visual element for, the design, for that, that side of it that's design, you absolutely need it. Um, you take away a lot if all you do is a, a Mega Man um, like serialized novel. You know, it still could be good, it could add to it, but uh, you, the visual needs to be there. And uh, I see that a lot in, in licensed comics, and especially now that it, it, they're less money grabs. You know, the, it helps having that license and that logo and the thing, you know, I bought Mega Man because I played it as a kid. That helps. But lately, last half decade, maybe more, um, there's been real work to make real mythologies and real stories and make real characters out of some of these things that when we were kids were, um, you know, were very surface level. I think the biggest example of that, and I don't, you know, I, I, I hesitate to say something good about Power Rangers, but... Uh, Burke doesn't get these far, this far or even starts these videos, so it's okay. But, uh, you know, the Power Rangers are an example of that. You know, the very little bit I read is like, oh, you built a real story and some real structure around this really, really, really shallow show. You know, and aside from the, the first movie, Transformers the same way. Um, and the whole Hasbro verse, right? Uh, so, anyway, that's my thought on those that... Uh, licensed comics actually can be good, and I don't, I don't, I don't subscribe to the comics for comics' sake thing, or not licensing or anything like that, because it's the best place for those to have real stories built around them. Um, Billionaire Island. This one is uh, number three. I may have number two in here. I can't remember. I did recently read that. Number four is on its way. Um, this is fine. Listen, the like this shtick really, really, really worked. Um, when you, that's funny because there's, this was not put in order for this, that reason, but when you, uh, really gave me a turn on what I thought was just going to be, uh, licensed comics, uh, with the Flintstones, you know, um, a lot of this is really on the nose. It's not, it's not that funny. I never laugh out loud. It does have that, you know, it does have that sort of silly, I did a laugh out loud once here. It does have, you know that great art, that sort of silly-faced kind of uh, almost Derek Robinson, maybe if the dude that's drawing Ice Cream Man was trying to be funny and not creepy. Uh, it does have that whole feel. It feels satirical. But it's just like, it's just so on the nose that it doesn't, like it's not, it doesn't come off intelligent. You know, it comes off, it just comes off like silly satire. Like, at the end of the day, these billionaires, like a good satire um, still gets you at the heart. You know what I mean? Are these billionaires going to be drones? Are they always going to be drones? We'll, we'll see how it plays out. But the, you know, his, his political views, which align with a lot of mine, um, worked a lot better as, um, as little parables in the Flintstones than they did here. Uh, or even worked to me better with Second Coming, to be honest, uh, in a, in, you know, what was him paradising that superhero uh, genre and religion together, you know, but this, um, this is just like too much of a bop on the nose, you know, this is like following his Twitter feed, essentially. Um, next up, what are we at? 13, not too bad. I can get through these quick as, some of these I don't even remember what's in them. Um, I meant to keep reading this in, in trade, and I was like, I only had three comics in my hand at the store I happened to be at at the time, and that's one of the better Scotty Young covers. Um, actually, it might be the best Scotty Young cover. And the book was great, too, by the way. I mean, just great. What a dark turn, um, especially with, uh, I, I mean, not the new villain. She's not a new villain. She was in the previous arc, but the but the person that she's using, like that's a dark turn for me to do that in today's world. There are, I meant to hold these books with me, but there are a couple books um, that uh, one of them won the Man Booker Award and uh, he wrote White Boy Shuffle and then the book I'm talking about won the Man Booker Award. But I would be reading that and I'd be looking at the name, you know, um, another one by a Vietnamese writer, I'd be reading that one and looking at the name and being like, making sure that the person was the, uh, from the culture that 
in those cases he was skewering like it was more comedic this one when i looked at it i was like i, I mean i knew rodney barnes the black guy but i mean that's a real edgy thing to do in comics today um even if you to me it was even if you are a black guy to use the slave sort of vampire thing going on so uh very cool very dark very awesome I was gonna be like, I just bought this as a cover and I read it, I'm still gonna read the trade, but I know the next variant cover is by Shinkevich and um, Jason Sean Alexander, his art is great, fits perfectly, fits that book, fits Philadelphia perfectly. I, you couldn't pick a better artist uh, to tell that story, I don't think. Uh, next up is Money Shot. Now this is more what I'm talking about, where you do some, that political satire, and it is on the nose, um, and it is silly, but it works because it's like within some other context, you know? Uh, if you want to talk about billionaires, you had to do it, to me, you have to do it another way for it not to be your Twitter feed. So that guy's obviously like a young version of Trump and uh, you know, they're still having sex for money, sex with aliens for money. And they're, you know, they're getting lost a little in the political intrigue and you know, they're still building the characters' relationships, which is hard because this is essentially a team book. Um, so, all of that's coming together. So six and seven are pretty muted. Not that there isn't like the sex humor and stuff there, but that first arc was like just, you know, building, expanding, exploding, exploding, uh, for lack of a better word. This might be doing the same, but you know, it felt like you went from five and then you had a new arc starts. So you had all the rising action and stuff. Both of them still good and funny, but maybe that's what's happening too. By, by, we, by the time I get to the end of this arc, I'd be like, ah, oh, everything's gone crazy. There's a guy with giant nuts. Um, so I remember loving this issue, uh, but not knowing, but now not remembering what happened. Oh yeah, it was a very big Magneto issue. Oh yeah, this is great. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. And this, I know from a Chip Zdarsky, um, uh, interview, you know, Zdarsky was saying, Hey, I was trying, you know, to keep my daredevil run separate. Um, but I will cross over with some of the bigger events like Daredevil's going to cross over with King and Black, for example. And um, I, think, I think people would think Hickman would have that attitude, especially with the X-Men that he wants off to the side almost. You know, he's changed them so dramatically. But there has been a lot of empire in the X-Books. There's a whole miniseries, Empire X-Men, and then the X-Men book while still dealing with Krakoa issues, has mixed in um, with the Empire storyline. And I'd say you could just read those. I haven't read anything Empire except for what was in X-Men. And uh, I had a great time with this. And Magneto, what this becomes is a way to make Magneto look like a badass. In fact, I'm flipping through this and I'm like, oh man, this is a great issue. This was, uh, you can read, oh, that was awesome actually. <laughs> that was cool. Uh, you could read 10 and 11. Um, you don't even have to read the ones before. You won't really be missing anything. They're, it's almost like X-Men have two Empire crossovers, which I know when I say that, it should leave a bad taste in your mouth. I, like, I don't care about Empire either. But um, they were pretty cool. And uh, if you want Magneto is a badass, Magneto acting like a badass uh, issue, there you go, right there. So that's what, that, that's what ended up happening, is Magneto was just cool as Fook in that. Um, I find, uh, people have different views on this X Factor book and, uh, I don't, I don't really see how you cannot like the first one. No, I really don't. I don't know why someone wouldn't like that first one. I'm not saying it was a great book, but that, there was like nothing really wrong with it. I, I, I suppose I can complain a little bit about, um, you know, being too cartoony, some of the art, right? So I guess that. That's okay. But the book was pretty cool. I don't even think this is faces are cartoony. Uh, David Baldi, and I'm not immediately familiar with Israel Silva. But I think this is I think this is going cool places. I mean, there are a couple times where I was laughing in this book, uh, going into the Mojo verse, which I don't think I read a book. I know they had that X-Men Black series from a year or two ago where everyone said that Mojo book was good. I never read it. Enough people told me it was good that I was like, oh, I'll pick it up and read it if I see it, and then I never saw it. So I haven't read something from the Mojoverse in, I, f I feel like it's been decades, because I haven't been reading X-Men, right? Um, so this was pretty funny. Like, this is the Mojoverse with uh, a bunch of, um, you know, where social media is a bigger factor in it. So uh, it's a good book. 
I think it's a good book. You know, more and more you're starting, I'm starting to realize that this, this that X-Men reset from last year isn't, isn't a, a real tight storyline. It was a way to, it was a way to spin off just a new paradigm, I think, you know, so. Um, Hellions, number three, this book's sexy. Uh, that's Madeline Pryor, always looking sexy in this book. Uh, in general, she's like definitely the evil Jean Grey that isn't the Phoenix. How many times has Madeline Pryor taken the Phoenix Force? You know that's had to happen a couple times. I, I have no idea. I can't even name or think of a time where this happened. Um, you got a good, this is, uh, you know, with a few twists, with a few major differences, Hellions feels, um, Hellions feels a lot like the X-Men version of Suicide Squad. It's all the sort of um, shitty characters that are still on Krakoa. They don't know what to do with them. And uh, right now they're in, in side quest mode. And I can't even remember how this ended. Um, so right now, it, it this does definitely feel like a side quest mode. Cleaning up stuff Sinister may have done. Um, a way to use Madeline Pryor. I think she's pretty mad she wasn't invited to Krakoa. Although shouldn't she be? She's still a mutant, right? But um, so it turned out to be it turned out to be a good comic. But like I said, I've I've heard mixed things about X Factor and Hellions, and I'm the guy that I think I just like it. I just like it, I guess, you know, I just like this X-Men thing in general and I'm happy to read all these characters and feel like I'm, I'm feel like I got in on a good breaking in point, you know, and whatever happens that I don't understand from the past is easily, easily looked up now, you know, there's sort of a unity between all of them, even if they do go back and forth. So this is something um, I respect a lot. Um, and I respect the art, uh, even though that Ben Day dot thing happens too much, you know, feels like transform. This is Transformers 84 number one, by the way. And, um, you know, I respect what they did with the story, you know, here, uh, the writer's commentary by Simon Furman opened up a lot of things to me. It, it explained what was going on. He's writing a comic book within the, as best he can within the mythology of the Transformers comic books that came out in the mid 80s from the UK and the US because apparently some stuff happened in the UK that didn't happen here and vice versa. Uh, I was just completely freaking lost. I don't know what I was reading. Um, I feel like I know the Transformers pretty well. I don't collect them anymore or anything like that. I've, I've read